Now in Genesis chapter 3, the verse that I wanted to focus on is there in verse 16, where the Bible reads, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And I want to preach tonight a continuation of my sermon that I preached this morning. I, you know, I preached long this morning, but I still didn't get through all of the material that I wanted to preach about, so I'm going to pick up where I left off and continue the sermon that I preached this morning. This morning I preached on the subject of birth control and why, according to the Bible, birth control is not right, it is a sin, it is not something that Christians should be practicing, although 99% of our nation today believes that it's acceptable. 99% of Christians and Baptists believe it's acceptable, but let me tell you something, that doesn't make it right. Amen. The Bible, crystal clear this morning, showed us what God thinks about that subject. And I'm not going to re-preach this morning's sermon because we already saw all those scriptures this morning. If you missed it, you can get the recording and listen to it. But I want to preach a sermon tonight just about what effect birth control has had on women, on our society in general, on our churches today, on families, on marriages. And so I want to pick up where we left off. But first of all, let me just point something out here in Genesis 3.16. This is after Adam and Eve have sinned. They've taken of the forbidden fruit and God is judging them, and God is placing a curse upon the man, for example, saying that for the rest of his life, he's going to have to till the ground, and there are going to be thorns, and he's going to have to work by the sweat of his face. Then he speaks to the woman, and in verse 16 he says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, sometimes it's easy to just read over things in the Bible and not really stop and slow down and let them sink in. This verse is packed with information in verse 16. This is a verse that we should not take lightly. It's a verse that contains a lot of truth that is later reiterated and dealt with in the Bible. In fact, in a moment, I'm going to take you to John chapter 16, and if you want to start turning there, you can. And I'm going to compare for you what we see here in Genesis 3 with what we see in John chapter 16. Now, what is he saying here in Genesis 3.16 to the woman? Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Now, two things are being multiplied in that verse, are they not? He says, I'm going to multiply your sorrow and I am going to multiply your conception. Yet today, Christians believe that it's just fine to just say, oh, oh, really, God, you're going to multiply my conception? Well, it's my body, it's my choice, and I'm going to take contraception. Look, that is a mockery of this verse. You know, forget all the proof that I laid out this morning, all the different scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, proving that birth control is wrong. What about just the fact that birth control makes a complete mockery of this verse? When God says, this is what I have ordained for women going forward, is that their sorrow and their conception will be multiplied, and then they go out and take drugs or use appliances to stop that conception from taking place that he said would happen. Think about that. Let that sink in. Now, what does it mean when he says, I will multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. The sorrow that he's referring to is pain in childbirth. Let me prove that to you from the Bible. Look at John chapter 16, verse 20. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Verse 21. A woman, when she is in travail, and, and the modern word we would use for that is being in labor. When the Bible says being in travail, it means being in labor. It says a woman when she is in travail hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart shall rejoice and your joy no man taketh from you. So Jesus Christ is using an illustration about childbirth to talk about the sorrow that they're going through over the fact that Jesus is going to die on the cross. And he says, you know, you're sorrowing right now, but your sorrow is going to turn into joy. 
just like when a woman is in labor, when a woman's in travel, she has sorrow, but as soon as the child is born, she forgets all about that because she's so happy that the baby is born into the world. This proves right here that the sorrow that's being referred to is that agony of childbirth. You know, when we compare John 16 and Genesis 3. Whenever we want to define words in the Bible, we just compare Scripture with Scripture and let the Bible define itself. Now, if you've ever been there when a woman gave birth, you'll know this is true. I mean, childbirth is a very painful, agonizing process. And yet, as soon as that baby is born, that pain and suffering is just immediately replaced with joy. I mean, it's a, it's a really a beautiful thing to watch. And I've seen, I, I watched, thank God, I, I haven't missed any of my children being born, all seven of my children. I was there when they were born. And it is a literally a life-changing experience to be there at the birth of a child. You know, and, and just to see my wife just in so much pain and suffering and agony, but then just the moment that that baby's born, it's just, it's over. And she's so happy and there's so much joy. Uh, it, it really is life-changing. It really is a, a powerful uh, feeling when you're there. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. That's what we see here. And what I want to uh, show you from this is that also using birth control, it robs us of a lot of joy in our lives. Because yes, there is sorrow associated with childbirth. Yes, it is painful. And you know what? My wife you know, is expecting our eighth right now, and she's dreading going into labor. And she's saying, I don't want to go into labor because it's so painful. You know, she just, I don't want to do this again. And she's already done it so many times. But when the time comes, she always does it. She always does great. It's over, and she has the joy. But it robs us of joy in our lives because the Bible tells us, and if you would, turn to Psalm 113. Psalm 113, but let me read for you from 3 John, verse 4. John said, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So according to John, there's great joy when a man is born into the world, when a baby's born. And then later when that child grows up and lives for the Lord and serves the Lord, there is no greater joy than to have your children walking in truth and to raise up children that would serve the Lord with their life. There's nothing greater than that. Psalm 113 verse uh, 7 says this, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful, notice that word, a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Children bring joy to our lives. They bring joy to a mother's life. They bring joy to a father's life. And I can't tell you how many times per day we rejoice in our children. Just, it's fun to be around them. They bring joy. They bring smiles to our face every single day. We love having our children. So those who practice birth control are being robbed of the joy of having children. Sure, they get to skip the sorrow that comes with having children. They get to skip that sorrow that was prescribed by God, by the way, as His will. But they're also missing out on the joy. And sometimes we have to go through sorrow in our life to get to the joy. Sometimes the pain leads us to joy. But if you would, look back at Genesis 3.16. We're not done there. I want to point out one other thing about this verse. And then I'm going to get into the effects, the harmful effects on our society, on mothers, on churches, etc. But look, if you would, at Genesis 3.16. It says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, if you look at the birth control movement, which really began in earnest in the early part of the 20th century, before that, birth control was very rarely used in this nation. It's pretty much condemned by all religions of our nation, and our culture did not accept it until the early 20th century, but at the same time was the feminist movement. And these two things go hand in hand. Because the teaching behind birth control is that it frees women of the bondage of, you know, being strapped to the house with all these children. 
And in reality, there, there is some truth to the fact that having a bunch of children does tie a woman to her husband. Yep. But that's a good thing. It does tie a woman to that household. That's good. That's the will of God. That's a family. That's what we're supposed to be. Not just having women just going out and doing whatever, just living their life freestyle, free as a bird. That's not the plan in the Bible. And so you see that it's mentioned in the same verse. He's telling the woman, look, you're going to have a lot of children. I'm going to multiply your conception. The average woman has about eight children. You know, if you just look at countries where birth control is not practiced, if you go back in history in the United States before birth control became prevalent, you know, eight or nine children, that's a lot of children. And, and he says, I'm going to multiply your conception. You're going to have a lot of children. You're going to have desire toward your husband and he is going to rule over you. So it's the same movement that says husbands should not rule over their wives. That's the exact same movement that's going to say don't multiply conception. Do you see how those two things go in? It's the same verse. Uh, these are the things that women today in the feminist movement are rebelling against. I mean, Genesis 3.16 is the antithesis of everything that they believe in. But if we're Bible-believing Christians, this ought to be a verse that we memorize and love and, and follow. It's, our, it's the Word of God. It's what God has spoken. And so we see that those two things go hand in hand. So number one, let's look at the effect of birth control upon the mother. We're going to look at different areas that are affected. First of all, we see the effect that basically the woman now is quote unquote liberated or freed of the bondage of having all these children. Now she is one that cares more about a career and has all these other plans in her life. Now look at, are you there in Genesis 3? Jump down to verse 20. Look at verse 20 of Genesis 3. It says, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And what I want to point out about that verse is that even her name is derived from the fact that she's a mother. She's called Eve because she's the mother of all living. This is where women have derived their identity throughout history. This is an important part of being a woman, being a mother. But yet today... Because of birth control, because we've basically given women the power, we've empowered them to decide, hey, I don't want to have children, or I want to wait a long time to have children, and so forth. This becomes a part of their life that goes on the back burner. And it creates a mentality that says, my primary role is not to get married, bear children, and guide the house, as 1 Timothy chapter 5 teaches. But rather, my main goal is my career. You know, my main goal is to go to college and to graduate from college and I'm going to be a lawyer and I'm going to be a doctor and I'm going to be a marine biologist. That's my main thing. And, you know, when I'm ready, I guess I'll also have a husband too while I'm at it. You know, my main thing is to be a politician. You know, my main thing is to run a business. My main thing is my career. But I guess I'll add a husband into the mix. And I guess if I want, I'll schedule a few children, maybe one, two. Look, this is not the way that the Bible looks at this. And this is not the way that we look at this, should look at this. But, but it's the way the world looks at it now because of birth control. Because it used to be, you know, a young woman, she gets married, she has children, and that's her that's her job. I mean, that's how she's going to live her life. That's the way God designed it. You say, oh, that's terrible. But actually, it's joyful. Actually, being a mother, being a housewife, being, you know, that's a very good job to have. It's, a, it's an honorable way to live your life, too. Don't let the world tell you, oh, you're just a housewife. Oh, you're just a mother. Oh, you're unemployed. I mean, they literally count my wife as unemployed. She's not unemployed. She doesn't want to be employed. I mean, she's, she's a mother. She's a, a wife. She doesn't need to go out and get some other job. But that's the way our society has become. That's the way women have become. You know, we already talked about this morning. I'm not going to talk about it again. But we talked about some of the physical health effects of, uh, for example, the birth control pills, just all the damage that they do to a woman's body. I'm not going to rehash that. But, brother, I forgot to mention this. Brother Joe Rodriguez... Okay, he mentioned to me, he worked at a plasma donation center. You know where you go and they take your blood and you donate the plasma and then they, you know, they do all that. 
he said that normally the plasma is like orange or yellow, the plasma in the blood. But he said that when women are on birth control, their plasma is green. Yeah, I mean, they come in and their plasma is like glowing green. He's like, what in the world? And it turns out they're on birth control. And women who take birth control pills, their plasma is green. Now that shows you, remember, the life of the flesh is in the blood. You know, when your blood's turning green, that, you know, that just shows you the systemic effects that birth control is having on your body. And people will say, oh, it's green, but it's harmless. Don't worry about it. <laughs> right, okay, sure. But do you trust them? I don't know. But not only, go to, first, go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, if you would, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Not only are there physical health effects of these birth control pills, they, uh, they, they cause all the things that we talked about this morning. I'm not going to rehash all that. But not only that, they have effect on their character as well. Okay, we already talked about the fact that it causes them to look at childbearing as a side issue to more important things like the career and everything else that they're doing. When in reality, Eve derived her very name from the fact that she was a mother. That was her primary uh, identifying feature, is that she was the mother of all living. But look, if you would, at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13, it says, And withal, they learn to be idle. What does idle mean? It means you're not doing anything. You're sitting around like a car is idling when it's not going anywhere. He says, Withal, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. We see here that women who are not busy about being married, busy about having children, and busy about guiding the house, they will get into sin, the Bible says. They become idle, they become lazy, they become tattlers, they become gossips. And let me tell you something, a woman who is having children is not idle. I mean, it's pretty much impossible to be idle when you have a lot of children, because you're going to be busy. But we live in a society of idle women because of the fact that they don't have children. Now look, again, if God hasn't blessed you with children yet, or if God has only blessed you with one child, that's a whole different scenario. That's God's choice. That's God saying, okay, I'm going to put you in this position. And so God can get you through that, and God can allow you to live a good, godly Christian life and find other things to do and so forth. But when women are just setting out to go against God's will and to hinder having children, that's something else altogether. They step outside of the will of God, they become idle, they become tattlers, they become busybodies because they just don't have the work that women have that are having children that they're supposed to be having. But not only does it affect the mother, it affects our whole society. Go to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter number 19. Not only does birth control do damage to women, it, it, it hurts their body if they're using the pills, and it also uh, affects their character causing them to be an idol, tattler, gossip, turning aside after Satan, and everything else. It changes them, their mentality and the way that they look at having children. In fact, here's a perfect example. This is a, I've got some advertisements for birth control, just from some magazines, just from this week, okay? It's easy to find this stuff. I mean, if you just grab a few, like, parenting magazines or family magazines, just leaf through, you'll find this stuff pretty fast. Let me just show you how perverse the view toward children is today. This is a birth control ad. It says, it's, maybe it's time to break up with your current birth control and ask about the 100% hormone-free, more than 99% effective Paragard intrauterine copper contraceptive IUD. But here's what I want to point out about this head. Because you look at that, okay, what's the big deal? It's a, it's a piece of copper that you're putting inside your body to stop you from getting pregnant. So what? Okay, well, what about the fact that this drug is called, or, or no, I'm sorry, this device is called Paragard. Now, stop and think about that name. Paragard. Now, I remember one time seeing a product on the shelf called Paragon. And it was telling you how to get parasites gone. 
you know, you'll, you'll buy a, a, a product, for example, let's say your dog has pinworms, or let's say a person has some kind of an intestinal parasite in their body. They'll buy products like Paragon or whatever. You know, this is called Paraguard. This will guard you from having a parasite in your body known as a child. I mean, isn't that just a bizarre name? I mean, why is it called Paraguard? Because it just shows you psychologically what they're doing. That's right. You know, they're telling you it's a parasite. And I've even heard pregnant women referred to as having a parasite. Who's ever, have you ever heard that? You know, the baby, this parasite in their body. You know, and this woman just looks like she's just experiencing all this freedom. But, but here's another ad. I found this ad. Here's a vintage birth control ad. This is from, you know, I don't know, I guess the 60s or something. It's Annette Funicello. Who knows who Annette Funicello is? Okay. Nobody? Two people? Annette Funicello. Anybody know who that is? Three? Now, wasn't she like on the Mick, Mickey Mouseketeers? She was like a child star on the Mickey Mouseketeers. And then later, she was an actress and this and that. Well, here's an ad with Annette Funicello. She's in a bathing suit surrounded by four men. Four different men. These blonde haired, like beach guys, and they're all surrounding her. She's kind of got her hand on one and she's kind of talking to another one. And it says, That's right, boys, I'm on the pill. Wow. Now, now think about that. Not that's right, my husband. That's right, boys. That's right, boys, I'm on the pill. M I C K E Y. M-O-U-S-E, I'm a whore, I'm on the pill, come fornicate with me. Okay, look, this is what birth control does to our society. So not only does it affect women, not only does it affect the mother, it corrupts her view of childbearing, it corrupts her character, it corrupts her blood plasma, it corrupts her health. This is what it does to our society. It promotes promiscuity. It promotes whoredom because it teaches this mentality of, hey, I'm on the pill, boys. I mean, what kind of an ungodly, wicked advertisement is that? What kind of a woman would want to be associated with that type of advertising to just say, hey, guy, hey, all four of you, I'm on the pill. Don't worry about it. I'm on the pill. Okay, look what Leviticus 19.29 says. And look, I'm turning to Leviticus 19.29. We could pretty much turn to a hundred different verses right now if you want. <laughs> Just about fornication and whoredom and harlots and all that. But here it says, Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the land fall to whoredom and the land become full of wickedness. I just use that verse just to point out the fact that a land can fall to whoredom. And the United States today fits that bill, if anybody has ever fit that bill, it's the United States of America. He says, I don't want the land of Israel to fall to whoredom. We're there in America. I mean, we have arrived at that point in the United States. Now he says, don't, you know, don't prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore. Now, stop and think about the fact that in public schools today, they have education classes. You know what education classes? And these classes teach the children how to use what? Birth control. I mean, that's the purpose of the class. You say, well, that's not true. Well, I, you know, I went to public school and I opted out of the class because they said if you have a religious objection, you can opt out of the class. So I was in sixth grade. You know, I knew that I wasn't supposed to be going to this class. I knew my parents didn't want me to go there. I knew that it was not right. So I brought home the form to my parents and had them sign the form so that I could opt out of the public school you know, you know what, education classes. But here's the thing, I got it all secondhand from all the kids who went there, okay? And they told us all what it was about, of course, because, you know, for weeks afterward, they were all talking about it. So even though I didn't attend the classes themselves, they're talking about it for weeks afterward. And they were taught how to use contraceptives. They're taught how to use, what is that saying? And then they say, well, they also told them abstinence. Well, this is what it is. All right, kids, abstain. But if you don't, use this. You know, it's like hint, hint, wink, wink, nod, nod. We're kind of supposed to tell you to abstain, but here's the green light because we're teaching you how to do it and to avoid the consequences. But you see, in time past, there were consequences to those who would fornicate. 
In time past, the young child, the teenager who would fornicate, would face the consequences of the teenage pregnancy. You know, and they would, they would be a shame and an execration to the whole community when a girl would get pregnant. And it was, you know, it was something that people really looked down upon. But now they're teaching the children at age 10, 11, 12, 13, but, you know, even before they're even to that point yet, just training them and teaching them so that as soon as they get to that point, they're able to do it, quote unquote, safely. No, there's no safely. You know what safely is? After you're married. That's what's safe. Anything else is whoredom and fornication and it is harlotry, it is wickedness, it is ungodly, the Bible calls it uncleanness, and, and yet today in our public schools, birth control is being taught unto young children, thereby teaching them that they can go out and do all this stuff and have no consequence their actions. But you know what? There's a consequence with God Almighty. Amen. You can never escape God's consequences, even if you think that you've escaped man's consequences or physical consequences. Not only that, but our society has become so degenerated that we think that birth control today is like a human right or something. Yeah. Now, you know, the, we probably have all heard about the Hobby Lobby lawsuit and situation. Who's heard about the situation with Hobby Lobby? You know, most of the hands in the room are going up. What it all boils down to is that Hobby Lobby doesn't want to buy birth control for their workers. I mean, they don't want to pay for their workers to use birth control because they don't believe in it. They don't believe in these pills and they don't want to pay for it. Now, the way that the media will try to spin this is like, they're not letting these women use birth control. They're trying to force their workers to live a Christian life. But that's a lie. That's not even true. What it really is is they just don't want to pay for it. You see, there's nothing stopping any worker at Hobby Lobby from going out and buying whatever birth control they want to buy. I mean, if they want to go to the store and they want to go to the doctor and the pharmacy and just buy birth control, they can just go knock themselves out and do that. But what it is is that now businesses that don't even believe in it are being forced to pay for it. And they call this an attack on women, the war on women. They call this, oh, just this violation of women's rights. You won't buy my accoutrements so I can go be a whore. You won't buy them for me. I mean, they had this lady come testify before Congress about Obamacare. Okay? I forget. What was her name? Does anybody remember? This, this, this horrible, this, 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 uh, I'm trying to think of a word that's not too offensive. I want, I want to use a word that's offensive, but not, not too, not too offensive, you know. This, this whore. You know, whatever she is. But she was, a, she was a college student. She's not married. She's testifying before Congress about how it was just, she just couldn't afford all her birth control through college. She's trying to put herself through law school at Georgetown, and she just can't afford all the birth control, and it's not fair, and it's not right, and somebody needs to pay for my birth control. You're not married. You're, not, you're supposed to be a virgin. You know, you're not supposed to be doing that. That's not, but, but yet today, our society has degenerated so much that we think that that's like a human right. Just everybody just, I mean, yeah, it's like food, raiment, and birth control are the three basic needs, apparently, of, of our lives. It's bizarre. And then there's this whole, there's this whole slew of new advertising, okay? These Obamacare ads that promote promiscuity and talk about birth control. For example, I saw this ad, and it's this got insurance campaign, okay? And it's put out by these different liberal groups and progressive groups in Colorado and different places, and it's a pro-Obamacare advertising of the liberals. And in this ad, it shows a picture of a man and a woman, and it says, OMG, he's hot. Let's hope he's as easy to get as this birth control. My health insurance covers the pill, which means all I have to worry about is getting him between the covers. I got insurance. Thanks, Obamacare. I mean, these are the type of ads that these groups are putting out to, to promote Obamacare and to get people to sign up for insurance. Another ad showed a guy doing a handstand on top of a beer keg. And he says, if I fall and hurt myself, 
I'm covered because I have insurance thanks to Obamacare. I'm not even joking. I mean, you'd think it was a parody. I mean, you'd literally think this is like a mockery that Christians are putting out just to make fun of our sinful world or that, you know, conservatives are putting out to attack Obamacare. No, these are liberal, progressive groups showing, hey, I can get my flu shots and I can take shots of hard liquor. And it's showing all these women and they're drinking and they have, they're all covered and they have insurance and it's great. And they're, they're drinking and fornicating and they're saying, hey baby, it's, I mean, it shows men and women chatting each other up like, hey baby, I've got insurance. All we have to worry about is just getting it on, you know, because we've already got all the Obamacare covering our birth control. And, and then it says at the bottom, you know, warning, it's not going to protect you from STDs. You know, you still got to buy more stuff. But your insurance will probably cover all that too. It's sick. It's disgusting. It's wicked. It's evil. But let me tell you something. This is what our country is becoming. And you know what Christians want to do? They want to get as close to it as they can without going over the cliff. Look, if we would have been on God's program all along, if we would have had a biblical view of marriage, if we would have had a biblical view of child rearing, if we would have had a biblical view of birth control, you know, our society wouldn't be going to hell in a handbasket. But it's, God said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall pray and humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their lamb. You see, if the light that is in us be darkness, how great is that darkness? And when even God's people and even churches today are totally in defiance of God's program for the family, obviously the world's going to take it a step further. And so we see that birth control has had a destructive effect on women and their mentality and on their attitude and on their lifestyle. We see that it's physically damaged their bodies. We see that it's had a horrible effect on our society, just turning our country over to whoredoms in general. But not only that, thirdly, it has had negative effect on marriage today. It affects marriage adversely when birth control is used. Let me just point out a study that was done in August of 2013. I thought this was interesting. A new study conducted by Ohio State University, they studied 57,000 adults between 1972 and 2012. They found that children who grow up in large families have lower rates of divorce. You know, children who grow up in a large family are less likely to get divorced. And they said there is a meaningful gap in the probability of divorce when you compare children with large families to those of one child. And every child you add up to a certain point keeps on getting, you're less likely to get divorced. If you came from a family of three versus two, four versus three, five versus four, you know, you got seven kids in the family, you're less likely to get divorced. Why? Because it's just large families are preferable to small families. Now, again, it's different if God gives you a small family. That's God's will. God knows what he's doing. God is in control. Amen. But when we take God out of control, you know, it doesn't make any sense to just have a small family on purpose when a large family has benefits. Okay. And, you know, when you see a statistic like this, it just shows you. And not only that, but just if you think about it, having children together is going to draw the family closer Using birth control creates a selfish mentality of kind of like we're, both, we're all going to do our own thing. Now, I, I don't really have this in my notes, but I think another thing to, to consider when you think about the effect of birth control on a family is that the, the children that you have, they see you using birth control and saying, oh yeah, we're done. We don't want it anymore. We're done. I mean, how do you think that makes the children feel? And again, if, you know, if, if, if your child knows, okay, well, you know, my parents only have one child, two child, three child, because that's all God gave them, but they love us and they want more, no problem. But when your children just know that you stopped after them, you're having children, having children, and then they're born, and you're like, we're done. Okay. Now, it's got to make them feel a little bit bad, like maybe they're not that loved. I mean, think about this. What if you find out that you're expecting another child, right? 
Let's say you've got four children and you find out the fifth child's on the way. And you call your parents and said, hey, mom and dad, I've got great news. We've got another child on the way. Now, what if they said to you, another one? You guys are having another one? Now, wouldn't you be offended? Amen. Because you'd think, you know, you're like, yeah, that happens all the time. But anyway, yeah. or, or, you know, if your brother or sister just acted like, what, you're having another one? And the thing that's so offensive about it is, and, and here's what I've often even said to people when they act like, oh, you're going to have more. I always just say, well, which of my children would you prefer that I had not had? Because it just stands to reason that if you love your children, if you're deriving joy from your children, if children are a blessing, as the Bible teaches, then you'd want more. Yeah. But if children are a pain in the neck to you, you don't want more. Because why would you want another pain in the neck? And by the way, if you raise your children right, you'll have joy of them. Yeah. Yeah. If you spare the rod, you'll hate your son. You know? and, and so we got to understand that if we raise our children right, that's part of you know, wanting more, <laughs> okay, because, you know, if we raise our children the way the world tells us to raise them, yeah, I wouldn't want more of those either. But when we bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, when we discipline them and teach them right, they will give us rest. They will bring us joy in our lives. And so, uh, you know, I, I remember one time, you know, my dad making a statement one time when I was growing up. Just about the fact, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to repeat the exact statement that he made. But my dad made a statement one time, you know, something to the effect that he was really glad that he had the children that he had. And I remember just feeling so loved, thinking to myself, wow, my dad really gets a lot of joy from the four of us children. You know, he made a statement. I'm not going to repeat exactly what he said, but it was a statement that basically showed that he got a lot of joy in his life from the fact that he had had four children. And I remember feeling very loved hearing him say that. And you know, our children, they perceive whether we love them or not and how much we love them. And I think that we're sending them a message that says, we don't love you that much because we don't want more like you. Whereas if you just want to keep having more, they feel like children are an asset in this family. We're a blessing. We're loved. We're welcome in this family. You know, I mean, some people literally even say to their child, like, well, you were an accident. You know, we didn't even want to have you. I mean, what an awful thing to say. You know, I was going to abort you. You know, we didn't even want to have you. We, you know, uh, I mean, that's a horrible thing to say to your child. But there are people who say things like that to their children all the time. I've known people who said things like that to their children. Obviously less extreme, but when, you're, when you have two and then you start using a bunch of birth control, you're kind of saying that in a sense, like, hey, we don't want more. We don't want children. You know, we, we just, we have our two obligatory children and we're done. So, uh, number one, it has a negative impact on the woman. Number two, it has a negative impact on society. Number three, it has a negative impact on marriage. Did I have you turn to uh, Proverbs chapter five? Proverbs chapter number five. Proverbs chapter number five. Now, we already talked about the fact that there was a study out that said, hey, bigger families, lower divorce rate. And we've also seen the statistics that say that the most common time to get a divorce are in the first two years of marriage and the first two years after the last child leaves the home. That shows you that the children are a factor. A lot of people stay together for the children. Have you ever heard that? You know, people, they, they didn't get a divorce. They're going to stay together for the children. But here's how marriage works. Marriage has low points. Marriage has ups and downs. Anybody who's been married for any length of time knows that you're not always just doing great. Everything's awesome. We're like newlyweds all the time. 100. It's just that's not reality all the time. Now, there are, there are times where you go through a low point in marriage but if you hang in there, if you stick it out, if you love the Lord, if you love your spouse, you'll get through that. And honestly, I can say that I've had many times in my marriage that were much better than being a newlywed, even 13, 14 years in. You know, you can get to the point again where the love is rekindled in a greater way than it ever has been. And I honestly can say that my marriage has been better in the last year 
than in the whole time leading up to that, even better than when we were first married. Our love is stronger. Our relationship is better than it has ever been. But people who quit during the low points, they never get to that. You know, they think, okay, it was good when we got married. It, got, it went downhill, 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 and then they quit. But there's such a great joy in going through the hard times, going through the trial, going through the valley, going through the low point, and coming out the other side to reach all new heights of marital bliss. Okay, that is the reality of those who are in it for the long haul. They enjoy marriage in ways that other people can never even understand who've never gone through it. So people staying, oh, that's just horrible if they just stay together for the children. But here's the point. If they stay together for the children, in that time, they can fix things often. In that time, the love can be rekindled. In that time, they can both grow in the Lord, grow in wisdom, grow in grace, and once again have a great marriage and say, man, I'm so glad that we stayed married. So glad we didn't quit when it was rough. We stayed married. Children are a reason why people stay together. That's why when the last child leaves the home, they look at each other and say, well, you know, we're not staying together for the children, and they get divorced. I could name for you many people that I know who got divorced within two years of the last child leaving the home. It's true. I mean, even in my own, not only is the statistic there, I could give you the stories from, from my own life that I know, people that I know. But not only that, it, it can have other negative effects on, on, a, on a marriage. Not only... Does it uh, increase the divorce likelihood? Not only does it also, you know, if a woman is taking the birth control pills, for example, because she's having all these hormonal imbalances from the pills and becoming a basket case, that's not going to help your marriage, you know, because that's just going to create all kinds of friction and problems right there. But not only that, one of the popular methods of birth control that Christians will use, and I, I briefly touched on this this morning, but I want to mention it a little bit further tonight. A lot of Christians will say, well, you know, okay, birth control pills are, 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 are poisonous. They have all these bad effects, and they also cause a lot of early abortions. A lot of times the, the egg is fertilized, but it just dies because of the effects of the birth control. And, you know, I covered that this morning, and, you know, I've got all the science on that. But not, but, but, so they'll say, well, we don't do that stuff, and we're not going to be like Onan, because God killed Onan. And they say, well, okay, but they'll use what's called natural family planning. And this natural family planning is a pretty popular birth control method amongst Catholics and amongst uh, Bible-believing Christians. Catholics are not Bible-believing Christians, just so you know. But anyway, you know, um, Catholics use it. Also, a lot of evangelical, Bible-believing Christians use it. It's pretty popular today amongst people who kind of, well, they don't want to use the really bad forms of birth control, but they still don't want to have the kids and multiply and so forth. So they use what's called natural family planning. This is also known as the rhythm method. Okay. And what this refers to is the fact that, th that they will calculate using an app or software when the time of the month is that the woman is most likely to conceive. When the egg is being released. And so in a month's time, they'll, they'll have a blackout period of, say, five to seven days. And they'll say, okay, we are going to abstain from any physical activity between the husband and wife during these five to seven days. We're going to abstain from a physical relationship in order to avoid pregnancy. Now, again, this still violates... God's commands to trust Him, be fruitful, multiply, all that. But it, let me tell you how this could be detrimental to the marital relationship. First of all, look at Proverbs chapter 5. It says in verse 18, Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Now, verse 20 right there explains to us that if we are having the proper relationship with the wife of our youth, we will not desire to be ravished with a strange woman. I mean, do you see that? He says, look, enjoy your wife 
And then, you know, why would you even want to go to a stranger? Because you're satisfied with what you have. This is exactly what 1 Corinthians 7 teaches when it says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. The Bible says that to avoid fornication, have that proper relationship within marriage. To avoid the temptation to fornicate. He reiterates that in 1 Corinthians 7, 5, when he says, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. God is warning us that people will be tempted by Satan if they are abstaining from a physical relationship with their spouse. If the husband and wife are not having that relationship, that gives Satan the opportunity to tempt them. And that's why he said it's so important not to defraud one another in that area. And he says, only would you separate if it be with consent for a time to give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Now, this natural family planning or rhythm method, it is not saying, hey, let's take five days of fasting and prayer. It's not a week of fasting and prayer. You're not going without food for five days. You're not going without food during that time. What you're doing is you're just skipping that relationship, you know, during that time just to not get praying. You say, well, Pastor Anderson, so what? What's the big deal? You got the whole month laid out. You got all these other times that you can do it. You just don't do it during that time. What's the big deal? So what? Just skip it for those days. You got all these other days to work with. Yeah, but here's the problem with that. Number one, there's another blackout period each month that the Bible talks about. Okay, so, you know, that now you've got two, you know, five to seven day blackouts each month. So now you've just chopped off half your month right there, gone. And that doesn't necessarily mean that, that every other day is going to work out either. But here's the most damaging aspect of all, is that it is a scientifically proven fact, as well as just can be anecdotally observed in anyone's life, that the blackout period that natural family planning recommends while the woman's ovulating is the best time to have that relationship because of the fact that that is when women are most interested in that relationship because it's a natural process of their body that when they are the most fertile, that when they release that egg, that is also when they have the most desire. And that is also when they are the most attractive to their husband. Scientifically proven fact that women are more attractive to their husband during that blackout period, the, the, recommend, the ovulation time, the time when they could get pregnant, and they are more attracted to him during that time. So basically, the time when both husband and wife are the most attracted to each other and would have the most enjoyment from that physical relationship, would enjoy it the most, is the time that they're being told, don't do it during that time. Now, that just, you know, you're, you're, that, that's not going to help your relationship. How can that be helpful to your marriage, that the time that you want to do it the most is when it's off limits? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. Not to mention that half the month is off limits, practically. You know, by the time you factor in the other blackout period that everybody knows what I'm talking about. Of course, when you follow God's plan, when you live your life according to God's will and you're having a lot of children... You know, your wife's pregnant a lot. And your wife's breastfeeding a lot. And when your wife's pregnant or breastfeeding, there's no blackout period of either kind. And so therefore, you know, it's better for marriage. You can have a better relationship within marriage. This is a detrimental effect on marriage when you uh, use that method. Lastly, this. We talked about the detrimental effect on women. We talked about the detrimental effect on society. You know, it gets turned over to promiscuity and whoredom. We talked about the negative effect on a marriage, whether it's by, uh, you know, turning the wife into this hormonal, you know, uh, upset, whatever, uh, mood swing, all the different things that come with the pills, or natural family planning, just, just having to skip all this physical relationship that's supposed to be there. But fourthly, Birth control has had a very negative effect on churches. What am I talking about? Churches are devoid of young people. Why? Because they were never born. 
Okay, go to Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14, think about this now. If you go to the average independent fundamental Baptist church across America, and I'm not talking about our church, but I'm saying if you go to the average independent fundamental Baptist church, you will find a lot of elderly people in that church. A lot. A lot of elderly people and very few teenagers. Have you noticed that? Tons of elderly, very few teenagers. Now, why is that? That's not normal. There's a problem there. Why isn't there an even distribution of, you know, men, women, children, teenagers, elderly? Look, we love the elderly. The Bible says the hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. The Bible says we should rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man. We love the elderly, but let me tell you something. Something is wrong in a church that is just filled with elderly and you don't have the young there. There's something wrong there. There's something wrong with that picture. And let me tell you something. There's a story that is being played out across America in churches everywhere, independent fundamental Baptist churches. And you can deny this all you want. You can say that's not true. Yes, it is true. Across America today, you have young people and teenagers in independent Baptist churches, and they have no friends to fellowship with or very few, and they don't have anybody to date and marry in these churches. Because the youth is just not there. You say, where are they all? You know, I like this verse. Look at Judges 14.3. This is Samson. Samson wants to marry a Philistine girl. Samson wants to marry a heathen girl. Is that right? No. Is it right for him to want to marry the heathen? No. Look what his parents tell him. Then his father and his mother said unto him, is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all of my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. Now look, Samson's wrong here. He's doing wrong. He's committing sin. But let me say this, though. A lot of our young people are going to the world and dating liberals and dating unbelievers and, and and I'm not condoning it. I'm not making excuses for it. They're wrong to do that. But at least wouldn't it be nice if we could look at our children and say, well, look, Johnny, look, Susie, why are you going out and dating the unsafe when we've got a church full of young people for you to be dating? That's right. Look at all these Christian girls. Look at all these Christian young men. Why don't you spend some time with them? And why don't you get to know them? Why don't you marry one of them? Because they're not there. Yep. And it's a sad condition today in churches when there are so few young people. Yep. And aside from a few major, you know, mega churches and, and, and Bible colleges where all the young people from the whole nation congregate, you know, you go to your average Baptist church when you're 16, 17 years old and you're looking for friends, you're looking for fellowship, you're looking for somebody to date and marry so that you can follow God's plan for your life and you sit there and there's just nobody there. There's barely anybody there. It's obvious why. Because if people are having two children on average... Instead of nine children on average, which would be the average if you're not using birth control, eight or nine, there's going to be less young people. I mean, just it's just simple math, folks. If God's people would actually reproduce, we'd have four times as many young people. Where are they all? They weren't born. Now, look, you look around our church on a Sunday morning. If we, you know, this morning we had, you know, 112 people or whatever, there's 30-some kids. Of that 112 people, 35 of them are, are 12 and under. Okay, I mean, we have, I mean, in the age bracket of 8 and under, kids that are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, we have little kids running around all over the place. I mean, one thing that our kids can't complain about here in this church is that they don't have friends to play with. I mean, there are friends everywhere. Okay, now, now look at all the teenagers our church has. Oh, there aren't any. You say, well, but why do you have all these kids then? I'll tell you why. Because I've been preaching against birth control every year for the last eight years. That's why we have all these little kids here. You say, well, why are there all these little... You just happen to have a lot of little kids in your church. Uh, no. 
I mean, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but if I ask for a raise of hands, who in here had more kids because they heard sermons about birth control? A lot of hands would pop up and say, yeah, that's why I have five kids. That's why I have, you know, in our auditorium. Look, you know, one day I want to just get a, 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 people are always contacting me saying, I had more kids because I heard your sermon. You know, one day I want to get like a photo album of all the kids that were born you know, because of this kind of preaching, okay, that would have never even existed. But what I'm saying is, I've been preaching this for eight years, since I, because I've been pastoring for eight years. So we, in our church, yes, we are changing the trend. Yes, in our church, we're doing right, and we are producing a generation of godly young people. And so when our kids grow up, they're going to have a church full of teenagers, But you know what the sad thing is? The churches across America, they're not doing that. And so some families in our church will move away to other churches. And then other families will move here in their place. And you know what? The, the reality is that just everybody suffers. All Baptist churches suffer because the youth is just gone. Because they had so few kids that there's just a smaller youth group than there should be. And look, you can say whatever you want. You can, you can say, well, these young people just need to just do right. And what, I know they need to do right. I know they should never date an unbeliever. I know it's, I'm not making excuses for them, but wouldn't it be easier to serve God if you had a church with, a, you know, with 30 young people in it and they could have all kinds of, of young men and young ladies to fellowship with and they could have, you know, you say, well, there's, there, there's one girl in the church that's single that you're raised. Yeah, but, you know, that might not be the person that you want to marry, that one person. You know, you probably want to have some choices. You know, young ladies probably want to have a choice of, of, of young men. And young men probably want to have a choice of young ladies. Not just, well, I'm single, you're single, we're the only ones in the church. I guess this is meant to be. I mean, this is destiny. This is fate. We are the only singles in this church. You know, let's set a date. Do you see how birth control can have far-reaching effects that we don't even think about? Destroying the demographic of the local church. Destroying the demographic. Look, if every church in America were doing what we're doing, and had the preaching that I did this morning and the preaching that I did tonight, you know what? Every church would be filled with a bunch of little kids running around. Every church would be filled with teenagers. If this preaching had been going on, you know, for the last 20 years, then all that generation 20 years ago would have had a bunch of kids and then they'd all be grown up, they'd be teenagers, they'd be, and then there'd be fellowship, there'd be opportunities, there'd be a better youth group, and everybody would be blessed. Everybody would be better off. But we all, even, even those that have a big family, suffer by everybody else using birth control because then it's like their kids grow up and it's like, okay, we're here. We exist. Where's everybody else? They were never born because mom and dad were too busy with everything else that was more important to them than doing what God told them to do and raising children. And so it's had a negative effect on the church. It's ruined the demographic. That's why churches are filled with elderly people because birth control has been going on for the last, you know, heavily for the last 60 years. You know, that's why you have all these people. You have all these people that are 70, 80 years old. And then you just have less and less as you go down. It just dwindles as you get to the younger and younger generation. You know, obviously our church is, is changing that because we have this baby boom. That could be happening in every church in America right now if pastors would just get up and preach the Bible. Yeah. You know, but it has a negative effect. Uh, again, if you, if you missed the sermon this morning, I highly recommend you listen to it. But between this morning and tonight, I hope you get a picture of why this is so important. Why this is a big issue that, that will really make or break us in a lot of ways in our marriages and in our church and our society. Let's get a biblical view on this and not be deceived by the world. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord, and we thank you for the truth. And God, I pray that not only our church, but other churches would begin to wake up to the deception that, that the devil has, has successfully carried out over all these years, and that there would be a, a generation of young people that would be raised up 
a great army of, of Christian soldiers that would be able to serve you and fellowship with one another and marry one another and, and not, <coughs> not be defiled amongst the heathen, Lord. Please help it to start in our homes and in our church. And in Jesus' name we pray.